Okay, thanks very much for sticking around. And um, I'd just like to, before I start uh, my discussion today, is just point out the people that have been, been involved in this particular aspect of the TRIA project. Janice just gave you an overview of the many people that are involved in this very large project. Um, but here, a subset of people have been working on this particular data. So most of the data that I'll present are the result of the hard work of Inka Luzbrink, who is a postdoc that was co-supervised in my lab and the lab of Nadir Erbilgen. And um, toward the end of my talk, I'm going to be talking about dispersal of beetles. And the data I'll be showing um, were the result of the work of an undergraduate student in my lab, Jared Sykes, and my um, technician, Caroline Whitehouse. So as we've seen throughout this uh, workshop, um, what has happened in British Columbia recently has led to a huge source population of mountain pine beetles that um, are ready to do something. What do you think they might do? They might uh, encounter or uh, endeavor to undertake some very more antisocial activities once they've chewed through all the pine in British Columbia. Um, like becoming a telemarketer or a parking enforcer or maybe even a liberal MLA, but that's undoubtful. That's doubtful in, in, in Alberta. So uh, the other possibility is that they may decide to move to Alberta. And this is probably um, an inaccurate map uh, based on Kathy's findings, but one thing that they'll find in Alberta are different host species. Um, that they need to interact with. So here we have um, lodgepole pine, the traditional lodgepole pine zone, the hybrid zone, and jack pine. And uh, I'll just point out these stars, which are the locations of our field sites for these, these studies that I'll be talking about. So we had field site in uh, lodgepole pine uh, stands near Hinton, uh, a hybrid zone stand near White Court, and at Smoky Lake in jack pine. Today I'll be just talking about the results of the hybrid zone study. Okay, and this is a recent map produced uh, by ASRD looking at the success of uh, mountain pine beetle in Alberta. And so we know that, of course, uh, mountain pine beetle has become very successful in Alberta. It ha has successfully <coughs> colonized hybrids and, and successfully colonized jack pine. Another thing that we'll, the beetles will have to encounter when they move to Alberta is uh, different climate conditions. And uh, this is a cl climate moisture index um, produced by Barry. And I just want to point out that in Alberta, the conditions will be drier. So what we have chosen to do, uh, as Janice mentioned, is really focus on the impact of drought. And the role that Nadir and I have been playing in this large project is to look at the effect of drought on the beetle-tree interaction. So here are the various ways in which the beetle interacts with the tree over the season, starting with the uh, adult flight and host colonization, and then eggs laid in the, uh, along the maternal galleries, and then larval development over winter, and then um, uh, adult uh, development in the spring. Many of these um, processes are mediated between the tree and the beetle via chemicals. And so what we've been doing is measuring these chemical metabolites as a way of measuring the interaction between the, the host tree and the beetle. So for example, um, this is just an example of some of the uh, chemically mediated beetle tree interactions. So for instance, when a, a pioneer female beetle lands on a tree and starts to chew, uh, some of that host alpha pinene uh, compounds that she ingests are used to biosynthesize the aggregation pheromone transverbinol, the female produced aggregation pheromone. There's also a male-produced aggregation pheromone, exobrevacomin, um, and this mediates, of course, what's very important, the aggregation that allows for the mass attack, which enables the attacking beetles to overcome the tree's defenses. Um, Alpha-pinene is also a precursor for verbenone, which is used as an anti-aggregation pheromone. So you can see that the... Um, chemically mediated interactions are extremely important. 
There are many different chemicals um, in this system, but many of the tree-produced compounds are terpenes that are derived from five carbon isoprene units, um, and they come in many different styles. And there are many different compounds in pine. And it's generally assumed that most of these terpenes are produced by the pines for defensive purposes, but of course, because of this um, uh, interaction between the beetle and the pine, the beetles have um, co-opted some of these chemicals for their own purposes. So just looking at this brief um, group, myrcene, uh, beta philandrine, and 3-carine are all pine-produced compounds that synergize the response by the beetle to its own pheromone. So um, the chemicals, although they're defensive probably from their original uh, production, are, are used by the beetle for their own purposes. So as I mentioned, we, we've been conducting experiments in um, all different species that the beetle uh, uses in Alberta, but today I'm going to focus on our experiment that we conducted in the hybrid zone. So the objectives of this work were to develop a chemical profile of the um, volatile organic compounds, so those are the ones that are emitted by the tree, as well as the chemical profile for in the, of the phloem tissue and the needle. Um, and we were looking here at monoterpene content. Um, we also wanted to evaluate if the volatile organic uh, compounds vary with different environmental treatments. And so this is comparing watered versus a water deficit treatment. And um, in addition, we also had various biological treatments, including fungal inoculation, inoculation with Grossmannia clavigera uh, to simulate uh, beetle attack. Because when we were first working on this in the hybrid zone in 2009, uh, we didn't have any beetle attack there, so we had to um, simulate it. By the end of the season, we did. Um, and then finally, um, the last part, which has been um, really interesting and has ju is just coming to fruition, is trying to link um, what we're finding at the, uh, the effects of our treatments on the fitness of the beetle. So this is the field site uh, located about 25 kilometers northwest of Whiteport. And it, as I mentioned, it was in the hybrid zone. And we selected 40 trees with an uh, average DBH of 24 centimeters. And these were split in, into two main treatments, uh, which were the environmental treatments. And Janice showed a picture of this as well. Um, and so the water deficit trees uh, had water removed from their surrounding area by simply placing a tarp around the tree. So there were 20 of those. And then the well-watered trees were fitted with these gator bags, which are basically um, bladders that you can take, they, they, they'll take 160 liters of water. And those were refilled continually throughout the experiment um, uh, every two weeks. Which wasn't an easy task. We pumped water from the Athabasca River into this um, holding tank and then took the, the um, holding tank back to the field site and refilled the, the bladders. Oops, wrong way. Uh, just to make sure that our watering technique worked, we measured soil water content with time domain re reflectometry. And it did work. Uh, so there was a significant, a significant difference in the soil water content between the water treatments. The biological treatments that I mentioned, so uh, for those 20 trees in each of the environmental treatments, we took five of each of those trees and applied one of four biological treatments. Uh, this was inoculation with fungus, um, inoculation with um, fungus alternating with mountain pine beetle mash, which is basically just 20 beetles frozen, mashed up, and inoculated into the tree. Uh, uh, wounding alone, so wounding the tree in the same way that we did for the inoculations, but without inoculating anything, and then a non-treated control. In order to collect the volatile organic compounds from the trees, we 
wrapped the tree in a turkey bag. And um, then we had an adsorbent tube, which you can see right here, extends into that region. And these um, pumps then pulled, uh, pulled air from this into the absorbent tube. And then we were able to uh, take those tubes back to the lab, extract them, and analyze the compounds that were released by the tree. So we did this before we um, inoculated the trees or applied the biological treatments. And then we did it at a time series following inoculation, uh, up to, I think, uh, eight weeks following uh, inoculation, something like that. And um, just as an overall profile, this is the profile from the uh, hybrids. And the really interesting thing to point out here is to look at it in comparison to profiles from pure species. So here, up here is um, lodgepole pine with the characteristic uh, release of beta felandrine. You can see down here in the hybrids, this is much lower concentration of beta felandrine. Down here is jack pine with high concentration of alpha pinene, and here again you have an intermediate release of alpha pinene. So the hybrids really are showing a hybrid chemical production. Okay, so here are a series of data that show um, the effect of our various treatments. Just, I'll just go by panel by panel. What I found really interesting is that the total monoterpene emission was greater in the water deficit trees than in the well watered trees. And this was actually in direct contrast to what we found when we worked on seedlings. Um, so it really shows the importance of working on, on large trees. Um, the biological treatments also had a significant effect on the uh, monoterpene emissions. Uh, with the strongest response being to fungal inoculation and an intermediate response to the um, alternated treatment with fungus versus um, mountain pine beetle mash. And then um, wounding also was significantly greater increase in, in uh, monoterpene emission as compared to the non-treated control. Uh, down on the bottom, you can see that there's a significant interaction between the time post-inoculation and the treatment. Okay, so uh, in, in most, um, in all of the disturbed treatments, except for the control, which is the bot bottom line down here, all of the disturbed treatments showed a sharp increase right away after inoculation. Um, but this really only continued to uh, increase over time in the fungal inoculated uh, trees. Okay, this is a very busy graph. But all I want you to take home from this is this is kind of a community type analysis uh, that Inca did called the redundancy analysis, where she can um, illustrate that certain emissions of certain compounds are correlated with certain treatments. Okay? So what she found was alpha pinene, three carine, beta pinene, and beta philandrine were correlated with fungal uh, inoculation. And um, as I mentioned before, a couple of these, 3 carine and beta philandrine, have been shown to enhance beetle response to their own sex pheromone. So these may have uh, ecological um, ramifications. Uh, and, and then another thing that came out of this data is that the volatile emission, not unexpectedly, is correlated with temperature and humidity. Okay, I just thought I'd show a little bit of lesion data um, because, um, so what happened was after we collected all these volatiles at the end of the season, we then cut the trees down so we could analyze phloem and also measure lesions. And um, so this is a, a, a picture of a bolt that had fungal inoculation and mountain pine beetle mash inoculation. And what we found was that um, the fungal inoculation resulted in greater lesions than the mountain pine beetle mash, but we didn't really see any effect of water treatment on the length of the lesions. When we um, took the phloem from the harvested trees back to the lab and analyzed them for um, monoterpene um, content, the data were quite variable and we um, almost had significant uh, effect 
of um, biological treatment on um, monoterpene content, but not quite. Now, when we looked at individual monoterpenes, some uh, interesting results came out. Um, especially in the beetle mash inoculated trees. So there seems to be something important about inoculating with the beetle mash in addition to the fungus. So what we found um, with um, myrcene, we found increased um, concentration of myrcene in the phloem from trees that had the fungus and, and mountain pine beetle mash uh, inoculation as compared to the control. And also the uh, concentration of 3-carine was greater in the um, phloem of the mountain pine beetle mash trees. Um, and as we saw with the volatile emissions, the total concentration of monoterpenes in the phloem of um, the water deficit trees was greater than in the well watered trees. And then this PCA um, graph down here just uh, present some of our data from the pure stand work as well that I'm not going into detail today, but just shows you that the um, hybrids, which are shown by the little stars, really do, um, based on their chemotyping, fall between the lodgepole and jack pine very nicely. They, they um, scatter out. <clears throat> Uh, we also did a little bit of work on looking at the um, nitrogen content in the phloem and uh, as other people have shown there was a significant effect of um, biological treatment on the content of nitrogen in the phloem so the fungal inoculated trees had the most nitrogen in, in the um, in the phloem but there was also an almost significant effect of water um, on nitrogen content of the phloem. So the wa well watered trees tended to have more nitrogen than the water deficit trees. So I, I mentioned that um, we, we were also interested in looking at how these environmental and biological uh, treatments actually impact the beetle. And so once we cut down these trees at the end of the experiment, um, we took bolts from each of the various uh, treated trees back to the lab and inoculated them with four pairs of mountain pine beetles per bolt. Um, the offspring that were generated in these uh, treatments uh, from these treated bolts uh, were then analyzed for their weight, their size, and we extracted them um, to determine their fat content using a sock slit fat extraction technique. One really interesting thing that came out of this was that although we found in the um, water deficit trees that they were uh, emitting more chemicals, we found that the beetles coming out of those water deficit trees um, were fatter. So there was a significant effect of water regime on fat content of the, of the beetle, which is generally used as an um, indicator of the fitness of the beetle. So from this um, particular part of our work, we can summarize a few things. That the chemical profile of mature lodgepole and jack pine hybrids really represents a mixture of both species um, uh, from the emissions from the bowls uh, for their uh, volatile organic compounds. Um, another uh, interesting thing was that the total monoterpene emission was higher in those stress trees, uh, in those water deficit trees, which may mean that they are easier to detect on the landscape for the beetle than um, our well watered trees. Um, the fungal inoculation increased the emission of volatile organic compounds. And important individual monoterpenes that have been shown to have an ecological effect on the beetle um, with respect to mate finding uh, are elevated uh, in trees that have been inoculated by beetle mash. Um, the 
nitrogen content in the phloem of the fungal inoculated trees uh, was higher. And also the beetles, the bottom line really, how the beetles do in those trees, the beetles that emerge from the water deficit bolts had a higher fat content. One thing that we had planned to do in this study uh, was to then take some of the offspring that had been um, reared in those variously treated bolts to see how far they would fly. But we really just didn't have enough offspring coming out to do the fat content and the flight work. So we've proceeded with our flight work um, using beetles that naturally infested, in this case, lodgepole pine. So our, our goals for this part of the um, presentation were really to dis determine how far can beetles fly under their own power. This is different, of course, from those wind-driven dispersal events, but this is uh, looking at the uh, individual capacity of beetles to fly. Um, and in this work, we've evaluated the effect of beetle sex and age on their c capacity to fly. And we also now have the data to look at um, how, how position in the emergence curve influence, influences flight capacity, but I, I don't have those data to present today. Um, the, and then the final thing is we wanted to quantify how um, lipid was spent during flight. So we, after the flight bioassays were conducted, we measured the, flight con the fat content of the beetles and compared that to similarly treated beetles that were not flown. Um, so the, these, as I mentioned, were beetles that were naturally, uh, had naturally attacked lodgepole pine, and so we just collected the attack trees from the field and let them emerge in the lab. And we tested three different age groups. Uh, our young group was one to three days post-emergence from the bolt. Our middle aged was five to seven days old, and our old beetles were nine to 11 days old. Uh, we set them up on these um, computer-linked flight mills, um, and they were permitted, they were allowed to stay in flight for 24 hours before we uh, ended the um, assay. And so what happens is the beetles fly around and they pass this sensor, which triggers the number of rotations that they're doing, and there we, therefore we can measure how far they're flying, how fast they're flying, how often they're flying within uh, the, the given time period. After the flight was completed, the beetles were frozen for later um, fat extraction. So yeah, there, there's a beetle in flight, and you can see... There, yeah, I'll show you, I'll go back and show you how they, they get tethered back to the, um, they're tethered to the end of that arm. So we, it's hard to see, the picture is a little dark, but the, um, we have a wire that's attached to the pronotum of the beetle. Uh, it's, it's pretty tricky to get it on there without interfering with the capacity of the wings to open, but uh, Jared's gotten pretty good at it. <laughs> so um, then they, those tethers are then inserted on the end of the, of the flight mill arm here, and then they can power the flight moving around. Okay, so this is just an overview of those data. Um, <coughs> the average distance that beetles flew was about three kilometers, but we did have the longest flying beetle, 24 kilometers. That's been our record so far. Uh, you can see down here that the older beetles are less capable of flying uh, as far. Um, and uh, I'll just point out, and, and the, the velocity that they're mostly flying is about um, 0.5 meters per second. Okay, just looking at some of this data more closely, um, what we really found uh, to, to power flight, so to speak, was the um, pre-flight weight of the beetle. So the total distance flown by beetles was positively correlated with beetle pre-flight weight. And as I uh, alluded to in that summary table, age did significantly affect um, the total distance flown by the beetles, and middle-aged beetles flew the farthest and old beetles uh, were not as good at dispersing. 
When we looked at total flight duration, this also increased with how heavy the beetles were. And there was a significant interaction between sex and age that affected the duration of the flight. So males actually spend more time in flight than females do, except for those old males that really decrease their uh, dispersal capacity. After, um, after the flights were over, we then extracted the beetles for their fat content. And um, now we can uh, unequivocally say that flat fat appears to power flight because the uh, control beetles all had greater co fat content than the um, flown beetles, and females have more fat than males, um, which we already knew. Um, and so to summarize this part of the, um, the work, what our initial studies on dispersal have shown us is that the beetle weight really dictates how far they can fly. Um, there's a positive relationship not only in between pre-flight weight and flight distance, but also the likelihood of beetles to fly, which was to me surprisingly high. We had about between 60 and 80 percent of all our beetles actually flew. Um, and there's also a positive relationship between pre-flight weight and the total time spent flying and their, their, how fast they can fly. <clears throat> um, a little bit more surprising to me was that the propensity for flight, the distance flown, and the velocity were similar among male and female beetles. And flight distance increased with beetle age, but only up until their middle age, and then it decreased in old beetles. Um, and finally, the beetle sex and age affect the time spent flying and the body lip lipid content post-flight. Um, continuing with this work under TRIA, we're going to be looking at a, a bunch of other questions that affect, that may uh, affect beetle dis uh, dispersal now that we have this um, set up up and running. And so finally, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, many people that have been involved directly with this part of our work, um, uh, especially members of, of Nadir and my lab, and also um, uh, ASRD uh, personnel like Brad and Devin have been extremely helpful to us in um, getting these projects off the ground. So thank you very much. <laughs>